Hi everyone, it's Mina here and I am here with Dr. Suraj Bali. He is, uh, he is uh, no stranger to anyone and he is, uh, has been a practicing veter veterinarian for over 50 years. He started in 1969 and even to, the, to this day, over 50 years, he is still a practicing veterina veterinarian and also he has been the, com the chairman for GCOM for several elections in Guyana. So one of, one of the reasons that I asked um, Dr. Serge Bali for this interview is that I think he should be promoted as a role model for the youths in this country because of his service to this country and that is my reason for doing this interview because um, he is someone I respect and I admire uh, a lot especially with his fluency uh, sharpness of his brain I really really admire that because um, for a person with over 50 years and he still uh, service to Guyana and he's still working I um, I really respect that kind of strength and and his care for animals. So I am here uh, with him in his his office here, um, where he practices his, his his care for animals. And I will be asking him some questions, um, and he will be answering them. So Dr. Serge Bali, thank you very much for accommodating me. Um, I'm really happy. I am a little bit nervous. I had to think I'm bringing Sparky to the vet so to calm me down. So uh, my first question to you is uh, where did you grow up and um, what was it like? Well, I grew up in Rob Street, Rob Street, Robin Wellington Street, that area, uh, where there were four cinemas in the close proximity. We had Globe, Strand, Astor, Metropole. Well, Metropole was down the road from us. Freedom House was down the road from us as well. So one gravitated at an early age uh, towards uh, the library in Freedom House. But that's another story. But I thought it was a wonderful time. But that area in the center of Georgetown, uh, I think that's where the flotsam and jetsam of society uh, congregated with four cinemas there, uh, that is probably true. Uh, but we, my brother and I counted the other day how many young men were there and there were, we counted over 40 in mm -hmm. one block. I mean Clifford Reese was around the corner, he's head of, uh, of, of Banks the age and Clifford was in Wellington Street, not far from, from Rob Street and then his <coughs> There was Louis Holder who sells, who markets, who produces in from the Pomeroon, I think it's called the Amy's, uh, the Amy's uh, Coffee. Uh, wonderful young man, very close friend, uh, went away, came back like myself. Uh, and there were sort of several others that grew up in that, in that area. Some made it, some didn't. Some went to jail, some were, were hung uh, for all sorts of bad things. But somehow we made it and then and I enjoyed my life there. Yeah, absolutely enjoyed it. And uh, and that's interesting that I said Freedom House was down the road because on the other side, uh, in the same block, mm -hmm. there was something called Clubland. And Clubland uh, was the Methodist Church, Bedford Methodist. Uh, that's what their youth group. Across the road, across Camp Street, was the Catholic Youth Organization Center, uh, and so we had games, but the, none, none of them had the big space as the YMCA at Thomas Lands, and so we all migrated towards Thomas Lands, whether to play table tennis or soccer or cricket or whatever. And I suppose taking us off the road, many of us. Uh, I would have to say that uh, YMCA was very instrumental in putting us on the straight and narrow. So that would be I, my first take on growing up. I, I, I truly did not have a hard time growing up uh, in what was 
to a large extent the ghetto. There were some rich people there too. Uh, only one house, well, two houses still remain. One, uh, the person who was one of our gang still lives in that house. Uh, that's the Tinker Keys. In fact, when Mrs. Tinker Key died, uh, her daughter asked me to write a bit uh, about her in a booklet, in a book, uh, and which I did uh, glowingly, because she was such a wonderful woman. And their, their house was the only one that had a backyard in which we could play. Okay. Um, were your parents kind to you? They were very nice? <clears throat> yes. Uh, um, my stepmother, I grew up with my stepmother, and uh, that was, she was just the best. Uh, she was an educated woman. My father was a taxi driver, but uh, very lucid in his thoughts. Uh, always felt that education was the name of the game. And he read immensely. If I went to the public free library, which was the church street around the corner, uh, he would take the book before I could get it. And, and the books could be anything. I remember a thousand page tome about uh, Mao Zedong and the Long March. Okay, sorry for that interruption. Okay, did any particular person play a greater role in your upbringing? Well, it wouldn't be person, it would be persons. Uh, I was saying that I grew up with my stepmother. My father always had this focus on education. The public free library was around the corner, so the entire gang, or lots of the gang, would always find themselves there. Uh, but it could be the lowest person having ideas uh, and there was one Mr. Corbin, a, bike, a bicycle repair guy, he was in Wellington Street in opposite Metropole. And it was amazing how much that man knew uh, of history, of politics, it was quite amazing. And, and Metropole Cinema was the area where lots of the political uh, discussions took place uh, against the colonial rule and so on. And as young people, nothing much to do. Uh, we would go and sit down and, uh, and listen to the people speak and, and that continued downwards because in what was in Murray Street, it was called Coroner Street now, there was something called, I think, Itabo, where the intellectuals of the day would congregate. And it was amazing that atmosphere, uh, that phase of my life. Uh, and uh, I, I, I always think of Steve De Castro, Clive Thomas, Rupert Brooklyn uh, I can't remember Walter speaking there. I, I've never heard him speak there. I don't think he was in Guyana at the time. But, so, uh, quite happy. Um, the interesting part is that even though there were so many poverty stricken people in tenements living there, somehow we, we all made it. And, and that uh, club land and that uh, CYO and that uh, YMCA, I think that helped immensely. And I don't know how that is, how widespread that is in Guyana then or today. I am convinced that that helped. Uh, the, uh, you know, I said that Freedom House was right there. The games we used to play with like police and thief and shit. So you would run and hide uh, in the Freedom House compound. And then my great tour was upstairs, which was the library, and you got exposed to such writings that made you think. And I always say that if, if uh, as a young man in your teens, you don't migrate towards uh, socialism, then something is wrong with you. But that's only my theory. Okay. Why, why did you want to become a vet? Before I go on to that, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting that I should mention, I said I, I grew up with my stepmother. Mm -hmm. But my mother didn't live, my biological mother didn't live far away. Mm -hmm. And when Mr. Burnham took away the stigma of this thing called illegitimate child, mm -hmm. he removed that from the laws, I think. But it was never a big thing mm -hmm. that I moved away from my home in Rock Street and spend an evening or spend an afternoon with my mom and, her, and my other stepbrothers or half-brothers. There was nothing bad about that, nothing bad about that. And, uh, then there's schooling. Uh, the, the school, I was thinking the other day that I don't think I, in all my high school training, 
I ever had a teacher that didn't have a degree. You know, uh, they were well-educated people in whichever field they were. And then there were some who made subjects come alive, like a guy by the name of Sylvester, uh, who then went to Northrop Belt uh, Secondary as the principal. And uh, Mr. Sylvester made history alive, showed us the linkages of European history and things like that. Even mathematics, the teachers uh, sort of knew how to teach maths. Uh, many people think that you, there is some blockage in our heads that you cannot learn maths. That is not true. That is not true. But anyway, you were asking me about why I want to be a vet. I always wanted to be a vet. Always, for some reason. Well, one of the reasons as a six, seven year old, my own little dog got knocked down off the street, uh, went into my arms at at 45 Rock Street, that's where we lived, and died. And I don't know, for some reason to this day, anybody rings up and says, my dog's been knocked out, he's bleeding. I don't care when it is, they, they, they can come in. Uh, but yeah, I always wanted to be And I didn't think I had it to, to, to be a human doctor because of, it would worry me that a patient dies in my hand, and perhaps less so with dogs. It turned out that's not so. So 54 years later, I, I'm still uh, having difficulty putting animals to sleep, euthanizing animals, or or having an animal uh, come in too late and I couldn't save it. Okay. Um, most times we are um, acquainted with, with vets taking care of um, domestic animals, like you know that people keep a keep us pet. Um, have you ever uh, take care of a snake or? Yeah. Or well, I spent five years in Africa, we could mm -hmm. start there. But no, there are enough snakes here. Yeah, to this day, uh, I wanted, in fact, one time in my life to become a zoo vet. And I did, uh, and worked a lot in zoos, went to all the zoo conferences, uh, ended up in Africa, where they had the world's, well, one of the world's largest game parks uh, in the Luango Valley, north and south. And the size of that park would be bigger than Spain, Portugal, uh, Switzerland put together, you know, huge, beautiful. So yes, uh, turtles, we are vets, and that's what a vet does. He might be an epidemiologist, he might be a surgeon, he might be an internal medical person, he could be a parasitologist, all, no specializations, all fitted into that general practitioner, no work, and yeah, but yes, some animals we have less success with. Uh, I'm not, unless you ask me, I'm not going to give my opinion on wildlife as pets. Uh, I, I could tell in one sentence, I'm not very much for that. The next question would be, uh, is a zoo a good thing? You're taking animals out of their habitat, natural habitat, and putting them in, in a steel cage. Uh, the other side of that coin is that uh, a Guyanese young man, especially from the urban areas, would never have seen a tapir in his life, you know, if he didn't have in his room, and so on. Uh, so, but yes, I always wanted to be fed, and uh, any animal that comes in. Uh, yesterday we had a parrot. Uh, there are certain things that uh, you can, once they, we can uh, hold the animal down, without giving it an anesthetic, uh, we can uh, do that. Because the injection for the anesthetic might be more painful than a quick injection with an antibiotic. Anyway, that's just an aside. So um, you worked in Zambia for a while. Um, what similarities in the culture you, you discovered? Well, it was a little bit more than a while. Uh, okay. Five years was five years, right? Uh, no. Um, Similarities when we're human. So we will all have the same, very much similarities. Music, the dancing, the sculpture, the arts, uh, wonderful. And right next door was the Congo. Uh, and uh, they, they are superb in their, like how we have developed, or the Caribbean has developed uh, reggae and ska and uh, rocksteady and calypso. Uh, they have a, uh, they had their own music that was just 
uh, enticing to the ear. And yeah, I, I don't think there were great difficulties. That's something I must push into and mention. I, in, I, part of my time in Zambia was ranching cattle, uh, 6,000 acres, 5,000 head of cattle. So I had my workers in the butterfly houses and so on. In all my years there, I have never seen a parent beat their child. And there, I can tell you. I have asked a friend of mine why we beat children here and there. I wrote about this uh, corporal punishment in schools extensively, very much against it. I cannot believe that a child can, or the other children in the classroom, can learn in an environment of terror and fear. But that's another story. Yeah. Uh, Similar. I, I, I didn't find there were no difference. Some people are very punctual, some people are not. Very <laughs> similar to yeah, that matter. You are uh, sorry. You are a very patriotic person. Uh, you could have worked any, anywhere else in the world, but you choose to work in Guyana. Well, I chose when I was finished in '69. I chose uh, to come back. I uh, could not get a job. And, but I did well in school, so they allowed me to go back and do a master's and a doctorate. And after that, third world was for me, developing countries. I couldn't start it. Nine years in, in Europe, that was enough. And, and so, I, a friend of mine, <coughs> uh, we were together in Germany, and he was a Zambian, and he became a minister afterwards. Even. See, when Zambia became independent in 1964, I think only 90 people ever seen the door of a university. That's what uh, colonialism does to you. A population of almost 5 million people at the time, and 90 people visiting the university, not good. So a whole heap of expatriates went in, and expatriates have their own uh, direction in life, which is to work a couple of years, exploit the country as much as you could, not all, contribute where you can, and then go away. My life spent five years there, uh, ranching cattle and then uh, going back into research. And that was so beautiful. And that the people uh, were kind to me too. And I learned the language. That was a beautiful thing. When I was in the Eastern Province, uh, the next door country is Malawi. And I could speak Chichewa or Chinan, Chinyanja, which are the same, and my children. Uh, they were better than I was. Uh, because English is not the, uh, the lingua franca in those areas. So um, that, that helped. And we really got on. And, and my workers and I, we got on. Not always. Uh, but yeah. that's another story for another time. Yeah, you have achieved a lot of um, um, accolades for your achievement and, and your contribution to the profession of uh, being a veterinarian. Um, what were your few stellar moments that really stand out that you felt that you have really accomplished um, you know, in your career? For example, I, I recall reading about the foot and mouth disease that you, you played a very important role um, in eliminating here in Guyana. Um, yes, yes. Uh, stellar moments. <clears throat> you, you make every moment a stellar moment, you know. Uh, but I have been recognized. I mean, I got my AA. There are people who use that AA acronym. That means something else. It could be Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> but I don't drink, so you know, it can't be that. Another something whole, uh, we can pass that. But um, yeah, uh, it, it works. But it also works against you. I was put up for the CCH at one time. And, uh, I did not get it, so I asked the person who was in charge and, and said, but you know, if we did that, they would say, I was by that time uh, in, at GCOM, that you rigged the election so that the other party would win or so that we would win. And I said, you know, and I know that that's not so. So what's the problem? He's, but as a politician speaking, he thinks in political terms. But it didn't matter, not really. Uh, stellar moments. The, I think what we did with the, the dairy industry, which I see is now being revived or they're trying to revive it. We used to have 
Well, the country drank uh, 15 million gallons of milk uh, a year. And, and uh, we were only producing 2.8. By the time we were finished after about 12 years, uh, we were producing 12, sorry, 9 million. 9 million. And only a few more. Another 10, 15 years, we would have been self sufficient in milk. Because we are self sufficient in beef and poultry, in fish, in eggs, uh, pork. We, we don't do too badly. But uh, that didn't happen, and I got the call to, to Chikong. I worked with 24 ministers of agriculture in those years since, when I, came, since I came back, which was in 1976, 24. Uh, Mr. Mustafa is, well, I'm not working with him, but uh, Minister Mustafa, uh, he is the 24th. They, I think that those 4,000 cattle farmers who formed into units and when we had congresses, it was amazing how they came. We taught them how to manage cattle, how to keep statistics, things like that. So it wasn't just minding the animal, it was how do you recognize when the animal is in heat so that we can do the artificial insemination. We had our artificial insemination technicians uh, crisscrossing the coast of Guyana. Uh, those were all, I thought, pretty great successes. If it was a mouth disease one, well, everybody said it couldn't be done. And that's another story of how it happened to be done. Uh, because I think the minister just lost patience and says, because one particular colleague, friend, uh, said, well, if Dr. Srivelli feels that he can do it, then let him do it. And he did that derogatorily. Uh, and the minister then collapsed and said, okay, if that's what, let him try. Well, within a year, we got the whole thing, you know. And our methodology, uh, that uh, the, the figures that we had to put together in the field, and the, 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 the way we did it, I think it's all over the world. People used uh, the, the developing countries, whether it's Malaysia, <coughs> excuse me, or uh, in uh, northern parts of the globe that are developing, they use it. And, and that's what many places in Africa uh, use our methodology to this day. Uh, you love your job very much and, and it's very dedicated. Um, up to, you know, today I'm sure you're going to be working. Um, why do you think that anybody who want, you know, who's a career-oriented person should love their job? Look, if you don't love your job, get out of it. It's as simple as that. You know, you cannot not like your job and, and be optimally producing. Simple. Uh, and I think uh, that helps. Big time it helps. Uh, sometimes you get exasperated when you tell a client uh, you have to do X, Y, and Z and they do A, B, and C or they feel that the animal should eat some grapes at Christmas and, uh, and that's not good for dogs and so on. Uh, but I become a wrong. There's a lot of it is education. For the last 35 years, I think, I have a radio program every week, uh, Vetting Your Pet or Vet Advises, whatever it calls. In the newspapers, it started with Ghana Chronicle, went to Starbuck News, now with Ghana Times. Over 30 years, we've been writing about uh, care of animals. Some people listen, some people don't. Like I, the one I know they don't listen to is uh, not bathing the animal every week. Basically, you need not bathe your animal at all. But Puma brush the animal, that would suffice. But that's another technical story. Okay. Um, so you have been the chairman for GCOM, Guyana Election Commission in Guyana for, uh, for, for a few years, a few um, different elections, I think four of them at least. I can, I four think. is right. Yes. I started in 2001 and I left in 2016. Will that be right? Yes. I think I am the longest serving at, at that time uh, chairman of the elections management body. Uh, in the Commonwealth, at least in the Commonwealth, if not in the world, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, a, a colleague from Canada, he, he argued with me on this issue. He came here uh, during one of the elections, the 2015 election, I think, or the 2020 election, or both. Um, and a uh, very uh, nice man. He was the chief, uh, the head of Elections Canada. 
but he didn't do his 16 years together. He had a, it was truncated where his mind is on one lash. Um, look, that, gee, um, whoever is taking that job, it's not going to be easy under the format that we use now. Uh, right now we're trying to do the ROPA, you know, uh, electoral reform, uh, and there are people coming up with ideas and so on. Uh, I had spent $25,000 of Commonwealth money and uh, to, to see how the Commonwealth, the successful Commonwealth bodies, uh, election management bodies work, whether it's India, uh, Seychelles, uh, uh, all over the world. And, uh, and I gave it to the leaders of the parties when I was leaving and said, look, you can choose from this. Uh, and I think, and I might be putting my tongue in the cheek here, but when you're in the opposition, I think you need to have changes and you want changes. When you are there, then you find how many pluses it is, how many advantages you have not to change it. But it's clear. But our system, our protocols are fantastic. And even for the 2020 elections, it came, we came out with flying colors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have been lauded uh, all over uh, the world uh, and got awards for being one of the best uh, management bodies. They, when there was the 60th anniversary of the Commonwealth or uh, Her Majesty the Queen, uh, we figured we figured there as an elections management body that came from a history of turbulence, blood and thunder to four peaceful elections. I was reading the other day uh, my, when I, I put up the code of ethics for the political parties and not only I thought it was, that was still, but that they, they adhered to it to a large degree. You know, there are always going to be some odd person. But the commissioners themselves in those 16 years I thought that they, in some way or the other, wanted to have uh, and wanted to achieve not just unity, but a better system. And when I say I, we had a wonderful protocol, it was those people in there, those commissioners. It might have changed now a bit. I'm not there, I don't know. But I recall when I first started in 2001, my first speech to the commissioners was to say, here, we have to rise above the political melee. Uh, this battling has to stop. It won't, it won't work. And one commissioner, who is still alive, because many have died in the meantime, he said to me, Chairman, that was a beautiful speech, but let me tell you, when I was a child, no, sorry, when I was in my mother's womb, I was uh, from this party. And I, throughout my youth, I was from this party, I worked for this party, I took jail for this party and you don't tell me that I'm not here representing that party. And that commissioner turned out to be, he was still in his going through the documents, coming up with ideas. I recall when we were going to decide and put it in writing, what is a political activist? Because I said no political activist is coming to work at GCOM. Well, how do you know? How do you define that? That took almost six months to come with a wording that you know. But at GCOM itself, it's not just the commissioners, it's the people, and they must understand, and they have, I think, understood over the years that we were one family. You talk about one Ghana, GCOM was one family. People did wrong things, they were fired on the spot. I remember one party with its team coming up at the nomination day, and one of my uh, staff, two of my staff, uh, were on the side of the, the, the going up the steps and lauding and clapping. Uh, they were removed and other two took their place. Yeah. So, and the thing is that in all my 16 years and four elections, without that blood and thunder and turbulence and bloodshed, uh, I only, I can recall, I only made my casting vote once because they're three and three and the chairman would have the casting vote or the chairperson uh, only one time and that was for me very clear that person that we were dealing with and which I and whom I had to make that uh, vote 
could not work with us. I mean, we, it wasn't part of the, the thought, the focus, the philosophy of G. Do you think a biometric system, recently the commissioners, they propose to have a biometric system? Well, I think you're misunderstanding that word. We have biometrics already. Yeah, fingerprints yes. is biometrics. Yeah. And we have fingerprints. Yeah. And we do it really well with the fingerprints. Mm -hmm. we, we hone that really well. Uh, the, the photograph that we take, mm -hmm. that's a biometric. Uh, each voter, we have a, 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 what's called a folio. And in every polling station, 2,299 or 2,000, well, I bet it's 2,300. There are 2,300 folios, and each party has, that is in, uh, sending the agents, would have the folio. A co person comes in, doesn't have an ID card, right? And, uh, but the man is standing right in front of you. The, the computer has all about him. What's his mother's name, name? What is his father's birthday? How much siblings? How many siblings he has, and so on. So, but more than that, thing, the man is standing right in front of you, you know. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's a big problem. I think what you really wanted to ask is whether we should go for electronic voting. Yes. That now is a whole different ball. Instinctively, I feel it has to come sooner or later. The world is going that way. Mm -hmm. But if, can you imagine, if during the course of an election, uh, two or three of the polling stations, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, by, that uh, electronic voting uh, collapses, or it comes up varying bigly, uh, largely from the, because you must have your paper trail as well. Uh, and, and there's a big difference. Now that is looking for trouble. As I've seen, because I think I've traversed over 25 countries uh, as an elections observer, uh, sometimes as a chief of mission. Uh, and uh, it's, it, it, we, 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 our system is not, and the, this proportional representation system that we have, mm -hmm. really, uh, <clears throat> together with the other pieces of the protocol, Excellent, because it is first past the post. You can get 45% of the vote and get no seat. That's happened in Tobago recently, or for that matter, Barbados. They don't want all the seats in one party because the other party came in second. They might have come in second, but they came in, might have come in with 40% of the vote. You know that is not right. The Congress of the People in Trinidad, uh, they got 25% of the vote, no seats. And Carl Hudson Phillips, uh, a few decades back in Trinidad, he got 90,000 votes, no seat, and so on and so on. Because you're coming in second. Second, there's no place for second, no seat for second. Okay. Um, there are always, uh, every, most in your life, uh, there are always lots of people who support you, but usually there is uh, support from one steady person. Is there anyone in your life you can? Oh, yeah. and that is very easy to answer. It will be my companion, my advisor, my the love of my life, the guiding counselor, the most honest person I know, and the most brilliant person I know, uh, and that's my wife, no doubt. Wife, wife and wife. Every time, and we are together now, uh, going on forty years. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, doctor. That's a nice piece of information. I'm sure it's encouraging for the youths. Yes. Um, we all do have, as humans, we all do have worst times. Um, how do you handle your worst times? It's a matter of self-confidence, I think. You have, first of all, to look and see if that worst time is because something you did incorrectly. Look at it, analyze it correctly, and if you're wrong, you'll have to say, hey, you guys are right, I probably am wrong. But if you have that self-confidence, and what you're doing is the correct way, and the arguments against it are not valuable or lucid enough, then I won't go that way. As I said, you know, I, uh, we, we always hear about the chairman this or the chairperson that, but we had real great commissioners, 
uh, I know that they they would get flack even from their own respective parties that nominated them to be commissioners. So, uh, do you like to read, Doctor? And mm -hmm. what is the last book you read? I don't ever read one book at a time. Uh, the one that I've just finished, it's called The Irrational Ape, which tells you, you, so, you know, I have it somewhere. It's telling you why we fall for disinformation, why we fall for conspiracy theory. You want to talk to the camera? Yes. So that's The Irrational Ape? The Irrational Ape, yes. It's, everybody should read that. Why we fall for disinformation, conspiracy theory, and propaganda. Interesting. Yeah, there are people who still believe that in 2015 uh, that the elections were rigged against one party, but the party people know fully well that that was not so. There is the legacy of ashes, the history of the CIA. That makes brilliant reading. And then, this is a booklet, but this is very interesting. It's called How to Argue with a Racist. And uh, <laughs> it doesn't help me, but because these are arguments I would use. Uh, but people come with science, like genetics. There was a man by the name of Richard Shockley. He won a Nobel Prize in, in, um, in for transistor radios. And he came out with something called eugenics, where we know who are the eugenics and who are the dysgenics. You know, uh, the man who got the Nobel Prize for the double helix, one of the two, Crick or Watson, has written really rough on this thing about eugenics, about certain groups and so on. Um, this one, Social Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy. And this is interesting because it's the making of the lords and the making of the peasants and the urban proletariat. Interesting, but more academic than anything else. Uh, we happen to know <laughs> what's happening in the urban areas and the rural areas, the peasant and the worker. And we all say we're going to help them, but uh, it doesn't always happen. For the cattle farmers of this country, I love them so much. The cattle farmers of this country, uh, then we would have our congresses it would be overflowing with members and we taught them how to manage their little communes uh, we gave them the improved breeds improved types of foods we made a place at what is called the Stances College Farm and we it was big there uh, for them to come in and, and for a week or two learn hygiene and dairy learn how to uh, know when the animal is in heat know how to keep records uh, that does not still exist, but it perhaps can be made to exist again. Uh, just one of uh, rotational grazing, the making of uh, mineral use blocks, taking the rice after the rice harvest, uh, the, the rice stovers, and making hay. Uh, all those things have been done. We are seemingly wanting to resurrect it, and I wish them a lot too. But that's not an interesting thing, and I should mention it. Um, we talked about stellar moments and there are some not so stellar moments like if I remove from the Ghana Veterinary Board, if I remove from the Ghana Livestock Development Authority, which I was the first chairman and which my lawyers had advised me, uh, make sure each one of the parties would adhere to the uh, dogma that you will not be beholden to any political party. It's Ghana Livestock Development. Uh, authority for uh, and with the farmers of this country and, and so on and so on. Uh, the Ghana School of Agriculture, we built a, a new faculty in Ezequibo. We'd like to build and should have been building uh, for a while now the one in Barbies and so on. Really students that we are bringing out but there there is a good team but the entire board was uh, removed and perhaps with good reason. I can't be the judge of that. Uh, but that was not, uh, for me, a, a very successful period. And uh, for the successful periods, man, the, the, one of my big sons, he became a national cyclist. He was uh, chosen to represent uh, Guyana 
in Seoul at the Olympics, couldn't make it, we didn't have the money. Uh, and uh, passing something like pathology, uh, you know you're going to be a vet once you pass pathology. It, it's so all-encompassing. Uh, those, those are the things that uh, you, you're very happy about. And the thing that you mentioned just now about the foot and mouth disease free clearance, uh, and we are still free uh, for the mouth disease because the, the protocols, uh, the defenses are still there. But I've taken up too much of your time. Mm -hmm. If uh, you were not a vet doctor, what would have been uh, your alternative career choice? I would have to say, again, tongue in cheek, that I would have wanted to go into the Foreign Service. Uh, to date, I've visited 102 different countries on this planet. Uh, wow. That's a lot. Wow. But it was easy because uh, in the Soviet Union there were 14 or 15 or 16, so you visited the Soviet Union to go to each. Now they are each separate states. Uh, the Caribbean, you got 16 of them right away. So it comes up. Uh, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, I think there were six states. Uh, now they are individual states, Slovenia and, and uh, Montenegro and so on. Well, I, I went each one, so it becomes, uh, it, it adds on. But no, Mongolia, you know, China, uh, Turkey, and so on and so on. And there are some that are missing still on the bucket list. I really want to go to Israel, and I would like to go to Southeast Asia. I've only been to Thailand, and that was a blitz visit. Uh, but uh, Laos, Cambodia, uh, uh, Vietnam. And in fact, as a young man, I was very active in the anti-Vietnam struggle. In fact, I was, uh, for my faction in Leipzig, the head uh, of the World Federation for Democratic Youth, Democratic Youth uh, which was uh, the, I suppose, the socialist uh, answer to the International Union of Students. Uh, but we did lots of things, uh, especially uh, to stop that Vietnam War where people come, my lord. But it only stopped when 52,000 Americans died. Let me make that clear. And we call it the Vietnamese, the Vietnam War. America never declared war on Vietnam. But they cap it, bombed them uh, to smithereens. And look at Vietnam today. I wanted to go there. So those are a few that I wanted to, uh, to go to. And you know, it's, people know that, like in Zambia, when one of the presidents came here, he particularly asked to see me and we met, and he publicly thanked me for the work that we had done, seminal work we did in animal agriculture. You know, so I, those are things that make you happy. Um, why caring for animals and having pets mm -hmm. are important? Because we know in Guyana there are pets abuse and animal abuse, so why, why well, is that so important? It cannot be unimportant if you um, believe that all life are all travelers on this blue dot spaceship Earth. It's as simple as that. If they are, if they are parts of the travelers, they are, they are in the plane. They, you, you cannot uh, see somebody uh, doing bad and, uh, or doing good and not condemn them or love them. Uh, no, these are animals, and animals, especially the, the higher ones, if you're going to use that terminology, uh, dogs, other animals, horses, uh, pigs, very brilliant uh, species, uh, they, they show jealousy, envy, uh, they show cleanliness, they show uh, wanting to be the alpha male, you know, and lots of these things that, that are human characteristics, they show as well, so we're not that far uh, removed from each other. Uh, and uh, I always say if a person could chop a cow for grazing on the hibiscus plants, uh, that person has the capability of chopping a human as well. But that's my theory. It doesn't have to be so. But you, to, it, it, it is not a great thing to see animals being brutalized. And brutalization can come in all sorts of forms. It doesn't have to be leaving the mange until there's just bone and the skin is all destroyed. It doesn't mean feeding the grapes only. It could be on anything, you know, a strained animal. That's a terrible, terrible thing. Or just throwing the puppies overboard into the ocean or things like that. 
Uh, not good, not good. Uh, but again, we are, I noticed there's a mushrooming of humane societies. We have the old style Bulgarian Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Uh, but we have Paws for a Cause, uh, Rosewood. Um, there, there are several others that uh, I can't remember now. Uh, the, and, and they all help in their way. And there are many magnanimous uh, people, caring people that support them, including pets. If, um, doctor, you had to choose another country to live and spend your life in, like how you're here in Guyana, which country would that have been? I don't think I have a choice. Uh, I, I don't think I can see myself leaving Guyana. But if you guys have a civil war, I will run away. Uh, my wife is from Dadian, and I think that's another country I love greatly. The way 1.2 million, 1.3 million people have put together soca and, and all the different music forms and their culture, their dancing, and they oh, so so wonderful, so wonderful. Uh, so I will, and, and her family is my family. So I suppose I, and I don't have any great family here left. Uh, a grandson, I have a son, that's two, and nobody else. So no. Uh, my sister just died last week, uh, this week, uh, uh, in London. There was a time when the wave went to London. Now the wave goes to either Canada or America. No, but I won't go into any of those two uh, to live permanently. Okay, so other than my other than my last question, I have this question here for you. I've never hear you talk about it. And um, so I want to ask you about this. Um, do you believe in God and, and why? I think there's a great delusion about this God concept. I personally have difficulty with the comprehension of this God, this all-powerful God, you know. Uh, I cannot even understand what is infinity. I don't understand what is the largest number, because all you have to do is add one. I can't understand uh, two parallel straight lines meeting. I, if they are told that if you look at the seawall and the grains of sand on the seawall, uh, on, on the beach, well, the amount of heavenly bodies are more than all of the grains of sand of all of the seashores of the world. My poor stupid brain can't grasp that. Uh, all powerful? Uh, can the all powerful person make a stone so heavy that he can't lift? Uh, think about it. If he can't make the stone, then he's not powerful. Uh, and if he makes the stone and he can't lift it, then he's not all powerful. But that is just talks. There must be a place for religion in the world because everybody, because when you look at thunder and lightning and you don't have an answer of why that is so, there's got to be somebody bigger than me doing that. It's as simple as that. And I'm relapsing into the vernacular because that's, that's how it is. Um, so I would be, and I used to give a lecture religion the greatest intuition to human progress when you think about what evil has been done in the name of religion and still going on still going on unabatedly and unabashedly uh, no I, I, I can't be too much with that the ten commandments follow those love your neighbors yourself you know yeah that, that's it that, that's it so I'm not a big religionist. Uh, I found a lot of hypocrisy in religion. And as to the God concept, uh, to, to try and understand that would be me deluding myself. So I have my final question for you, Doctor. Given that Guyana is below the sea level, uh, like approximately seven feet, and um, there is expected to be sea level rise. So currently they're constructing a silica city. 
a new city uh, for Guyana. Now, do you think, given that the University of Ghana is located closer to the Atlantic, the majestic Atlantic Ocean, do you think, or what is our, what are your views that, that uh, there should there be another uh, university constructed there? Because I was never, I have never heard any news or read any news about a new university in City because City itself, except, except a golf club and. Uh, and housing. So I've never heard anything, but in your view, do you think that there should be? I try not to make views, give views and opinions about things that I don't know enough of, uh, whether the technology and or the, the science. But common sense is common sense. If on the coast, as you say, we're between six and 12 feet below sea level, and the coast being divided, uh, being defined as from the sea wall, to uh, 20 miles inland, uh, then it stands to reason that uh, we will be flooded. And we have not been conquering uh, the flood waters. The flood waters. And 2005 was a lesson. A lesson. Uh, I, heard, I hear people saying that the flood we had recently was worse than 2005. No, they weren't. Uh, and I was in the business of livestock, saving livestock lives. Uh, but you know, other countries have done, have had similar problems, some sociological, some uh, ethnic, but uh, one leader at one time said, let's move the capital city, bring it into the savannas, the intermediate savannas. That was an idea. And that idea is not dead. There was a change of government after many years, and the new leaders were talking about that. I mean, I wrote a document, well, not I, a team and I, I was the leader of the team, uh, of how we can exploit and the intermediate savannas. That uh, died, uh, and we're still uh, punch punching with the coast. But you know, Nigeria put their city, their capital city in the middle. Here in the Caribbean, Belize uh, moved their capital. Uh, Rio or, or Sao Paulo, that has moved to Brasilia uh, successfully. Tanganyika or Tanzania uh, moved their city more inland. Uh, and I said Nigeria as well. And lots of countries. Certain people are fatalistic. Every year during the monsoon period, about a million people uh, might die in that uh, Bay of Bengal, um, which has uh, Bangladesh, and which has uh, Kolkata, not New Calcutta, in West Bengal. People die, but uh, that's life, you know, and that's part of the divine thing. Another thing that makes me question uh, about uh, uh, leaders in, in the heavens. But no, let's get into that. Uh, it, we cannot continue like this. That is clear. We cannot continue like this. Uh, the sea wall, I have pictures which I will show you, and you might take a picture of it and insert it into this YouTube thing. As so, uh, now as we speak, during high tide, where the, the waves are coming over three times higher than the sea wall. And we put it in the newspapers so we know, it's not we don't know. Drainage and irrigation is a problem in, in, on the coast. The intermediate savannas, we have so much research done. People got their master's degrees, their PhDs. We have Ibini, Takama, Kibiribiri, Kazurama, you, you name them, huge tracts of land that farmers can get and do something about. Uh, uh, just you have to have the political will, uh, the will to spend money in these areas. And now that we have some money, perhaps we should have a rethink of what we can do with this imbalance. Okay, thank you, doctor, very much for this interview and for accommodating me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Doctor.